So look, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us this afternoon. There, maybe there will, maybe there won't be a couple more people that uh, connect in, but we're going to get rolling uh, at this point. And as you heard me telling Aaron, we record all of these for posterity so and promote them so that other people can uh, catch them later on if it's not convenient for them on Mondays at four o'clock. Um, so with that, um, I'll introduce Aaron for those of you who aren't familiar with her. Uh, and Aaron Coleman is Senior Director of Advisory Services at the Filing Research Institute that you're all familiar with. In her role there, Aaron helps credit unions create and execute strategies to help solve challenges and achieve goals. She's been in financial services for over two decades, I believe, both working in financial institution, financial services, and as an advisor, kind of in the sort of role that she fulfills now. Uh, she's a graduate of Eckerd College with uh, degrees in both cultural anthropology and international studies and comes to us today from, well, I don't know if it's sunny, but I'm going to assume it's sunny St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> At least it looks overcast, but a little sun peeking through behind you anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's not sunny today because of the storm, but uh, oh. in Iceland, it oh, which is this background, it always looks that way. Iceland, that's where we are. Okay. Well, yes. thank you. Thank you for coming to us, uh, Aaron, from uh, Florida and Iceland. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Um, I was looking to the Institute, turning to the Institute uh, for uh, some perspectives on, um, you know, the impact on credit unions and their futures and members and so on and so forth uh, from a study standpoint, from uh, the Institute and all the research that they do and everything. And I got pointed in the direction of, of Aaron, um, who is going to take us through some insights and kind of future planning, I believe. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be cool. So Aaron, why don't you just take it away? Okay, super. Well, I am going to share my screen here. Um, and I assume everyone can see it. It looks like that is working we do. just fine. Okay, super. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you today. I know that time is really precious. And so it's especially wonderful to see uh, your faces, know that you're carving out a little bit of time um, to share and learn with us today. So thank you very much. Um, and as Joe said, I do work for Feline Research Institute. We're North America's only independent nonprofit think and do tank. And as you know, we're, we're very famous for our research. And uh, in recent years, we have we used to have this very broad approach where we studied anything related to credit unions in the world. And over the past few years, we've really narrowed our focus so that we center our work around five or six topics that you've told us are most important to you. So the centers that we run today uh, focus on business strategy. That's the center at Harvard that's just about ready to end its work. We're just doing the capstone um, final presentations and outputs right now. We have one on talent, uh, University of Texas at Austin. We just opened one on diversity, equity, inclusion at Michigan State University, and also a separate center at, this, at Michigan State on data analytics. So really excited about those two. And you may have seen last week a press release on uh, the new center for community social impact, um, which we're very excited about. And then we have another on consumer lives and transition which will focus on the socioeconomic needs and various components of those socioeconomic needs that we see. And we'll touch on some of those today. And then of course we have our Emerging Technology Center out at UC Irvine. So uh, each of these has its own set of outputs. We have a research event every year associated with each of these. Our next research event will be in January to launch our Data Analytics Center at Michigan State. And uh, those virtual events are free of charge and open to everyone uh, inside and outside credit unions. So if you'd like to participate, please check out our website at feline.org. We also know that that research does not move the industry. And so that's why we have our incubation competency. And that's where we seek out solutions that are rooted in real consumer need. We test those with credit unions for desirability, feasibility, and viability. And we look at their potential to scale across the industry. And then in advisory, what I do um, is I activate the research and incubation. So sometimes it's speaking and or facilitated discussions like we're having today. 
often it's workshops. In fact, I just ended um, a virtual workshop with the Development Educators class of November uh, with the National Credit Union Foundation where we talked a little bit about member experience and service excellence and how we can use the insights from those uh, research reports as they move through their DE project and figure out how to create solutions uh, that will help the development issues that each of them are focused on. And then finally, uh, we bring all of this together with our communities. I've already mentioned our events. Um, our communities include the Cooperative Trust, which is our International Community for Young Professionals, which you may have heard of, winner of Herb Wagner Award a few years ago. And uh, anyone who works at your organization can participate in it. The content is geared for young professionals age 35, or younger, but we don't ask for your age when you join. So if you're interested in understanding what young professionals are interested in now, please do check that out. We also have applications open right now for our year long cooperative trust crash. This is the first virtual crash we've ever done over a whole year with the formal curriculum. So it should be very exciting. So I encourage you to check that out. And then last is I3, and that is our internationally recognized innovation program, which uses our proprietary innovation curriculum geared to credit unions. And uh, applications for I3 are also open right now uh, to people in leadership roles in credit unions across the world. We actually have an I3er right now who is from Kenya. And um, we would love the opportunity to work with you or your colleagues in I3 where you will learn about collaborative thinking and then uh, spend a couple of years coming up with solutions to some of our industry's biggest challenges with colleagues from uh, across North America and beyond. All right, enough, of, enough about Feline. Oh yes, one more thing, which is, as you all know, we're a nonprofit and we rely upon your generosity to keep our doors open. So thank you so much for, uh, for being members, Joe and the Vermont Association. And uh, thank you to the other organizations and natural person credit unions on the line who support us today on behalf of myself and my colleagues. And if you don't know what the, any of that means or you're interested in learning more, just let me know at any time. I'd be happy to explore that with you a little bit further. All right, so what I'm gonna do today is spend just a little bit of time, maybe 20 minutes or so, providing a high level landscape of trends that we've identified as pivotal to the future before the pandemic. And interestingly, all of them are still relevant. So I'll draw some connections between the ways that these trends have been exacerbated and are accelerated as a result of COVID-19. And then uh, we're gonna roll into a discussion using those insights and experiences to look into the future and consider what might happen and how we might address various situations. And you'll understand more about what I mean as we go forward. So as a backdrop to our discussion, excuse me, we'll leverage data from our popular report called Credit Unions in the 21st Century, and also from our coronavirus series, which we published in the spring and summer. Both of these are available on our website at feline.org, and I'll send links as well. I think they're provided at the very end of this deck. So let's go ahead and dig in, and we're gonna start with this 21st Century report, which looked at some key trends in the market and combined them to consider some new banking models for the future. So we'll start with uh, socioeconomic needs. And we saw about five trends that are really shaping the needs of consumers we serve. And as you look across at these bubbles, you'll see none of them uh, went away as a result of COVID. And in fact, all of these have accelerated as a result of the crisis. So starting on the left, income volatility. Before the crisis, it was widely accepted American workers are having a hard time making ends meet. And many of us have seen that statistic about the 55% of Americans who couldn't afford a $400 expense that was unexpected. So the point is while people are working, they're not making enough to pay the bills. And the COVID crisis has exacerbated that. Um, and what we're seeing just recently is now that federal relief has expired, we are starting to see incomes drop. Uh, so in numbers that were released just last week, about 4.4%, this is nationally in the past month, after we saw a 10% increase in Q2, thanks to the CARES Act. So this is certainly an, a number for us to continue to watch, both nationally and regionally. Um, I have heard many tales of uh, credit union members who are hoarding their savings and paying off their debt right now, which has a real impact on us. 
And it will be important for us to watch how that changes as the pandemic wears on and uh, if there continues to be impact to the economy, particularly now with the latest surge in infections, um, you're hearing states are starting to really to ramp up uh, the rules that they have in place to help stem um, the increase in infection. So these are things for us to watch out for. Uh, the two tails refers to the youngest and oldest working Americans. So before the crisis, there were striking parallels in the financial condition of millennials and of pre-retirees, those who are between 55 and 64 years of age. They both had low levels of savings and high rates of debt. Um, we, you've likely heard about millennials and the average student loan debt that is approaching $30,000. Um, on the other side of the corn, coin, corn, <laughs> coin, by 2030, one in five Americans will be retirement, be of retirement age. Uh, and just five years after that, there will be more Americans who are older than 65 with no retirement funding than there are 18 year olds with no retirement funding. Now, this has a real impact to us because uh, the average age of a credit union member is in their late 40s. We keep trying to lower that number uh, as a national movement, and sometimes we're successful in pockets, but as an industry, we haven't yet figured that out. So it will be important for us to understand uh, how these trends continue um, across both millennials who are looking to attract and middle-aged Americans as they move toward retirement and to, manage, you know, to look at their financial health because that'll impact how we serve. We're also connecting it to the pandemic, starting to see some evidence of people retiring early. So when they lose their jobs because of the pandemic, there are more Americans uh, in their late 40s approaching retirement age who've decided, you know what, I'm just gonna take the hit and retire now um, rather than try to get back in there and look for work. So that's an emerging trend, a report from University of Chicago just recently uh, started to talk about that, so there's not a huge amount of data, but it's something that we should look out for. In terms of equality, we know it comes in many forms. Uh, more, most broadly, the wealthiest 1% of Americans have seen exponential levels of inc income growth over the past 40 years, while wages for middle income earners have stagnated and they've even dropped for low income workers. And my dad, who worked as uh, a college professor for many, many years and worked hard to make sure they continued to make a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, if he knew today that in fact, his wages did not increase but were stagnant for all those years, he would be raging mad. So um, I'm glad, I guess, in that case that he is he's not here to, to know that. And uh, many of us, it's frustrating to know that, right? And uh, what's more, net economic productivity has risen by 73%, according to the Federal Reserve, but our hourly compensation has only grown 12%. So we're working harder than ever and not making as much as we once did. Um, we also see that race plays a part in inequality. Uh, white Americans earn seven times the amount of Black Americans and four times that of Latinx populations. Now, when I say Latinx, that's just the gender neutral term for Latino and Latina Americans. Home ownership is also a prime indicator of wealth, as we're familiar. And home ownership for white Americans before the crisis was around 70%. And for people of color, it was just at 40%. So um, those are things for us to look out for, particularly as topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion continue to be at the forefront of our conversations nationally. And we're also seeing some, a term called intersectionality across underserved populations. So whether that be minority populations, women, young people, they are often in the crisis deemed essential workers and or work in hard hit areas or industries. So they're really, we're really seeing deep impacts in some intersecting demographies uh, across the United States during COVID. And then finally, in terms of the virus itself, Black, Latinx, and American Indian populations have almost double the number of coronavirus cases, more than four and a half times the hospitalizations uh, than white Americans. So those are all very important things for us to know as it relates to our ability to serve. And then last, the, the notion of the future of work. 
Uh, before the pandemic, more than 68 million Americans were considered temporary. So what that means is they either used gig work, that's another way that we uh, call it, either for to supplement their income or as 100% of their income. Um, these are working Americans who don't have W-2s, who don't get the benefit of having part of their taxes paid for them, uh, meaning Social Security and Medicare, and uh, they don't have health care uh, unless they get it on the exchange, which is quite expensive in most cases. They experience more financial shocks because they don't have a smooth income flow and their income is generally lower. Uh, statistics estimate that most temporary workers work between 11 and 30 hours per week and they make about $9 an hour on average. Of course, that can vary widely depending upon the kind of temporary work that you have. But if you average it out across America, that's how it looks. So um, there is a question around whether we'll see more contract or slash temporary workers as the economic conditions persist and some companies have to move away from the expense of W-2 employees and toward more contractors. So I'll pause here. Questions, comments, uh, anything, any feedback around socioeconomic uh, trends before we move to technology? Hearing none, I will move on. Of course, you can ask a question at any point. I should have said that before, oops, sorry. All right, technology trends. Now those have certainly accelerated since COVID hit. Many of us had digital transformation on our roadmap before the pandemic, uh, but in March when we were all forced to uh, go into hibernation as it were and rapidly pivot to a work from home strategy and figure out how to support our members despite the fact that we couldn't open our doors for a period of time, uh, that really has opened the door to a lot of opportunities for us and also exposed some weaknesses that we have in terms of where we are in our digital transformation journey. Uh, we know that consumers are using digital more than ever before. McKinsey uh, reported an 81% increase in digital payments since February. Um, and we still, now that we have been open for a couple of months, three or four months now in various capacities, we are seeing members come back to the branch, uh, particularly as it relates to high value transactions when they need advice, when it's a more complicated situation, members still want to see us and talk to us. Um, however, what the research indicates is that the role of the branch has really changed. So in this age of COVID, we're hearing credit unions talk about how do they best use the real estate that they own? Do they ultimately plan to bring everyone back? Are there ways they can continue to leverage work from home, both from a work-life balance perspective for their teams and also from a cost perspective and also keep their cultures intact, which is a really important part of who we are at credit unions and a deep consideration for credit union executives. Um, there are questions about how many workers we need to bring back, how much space we really need. And I guess, you know, if you think about it uh, metaphorically, branches we once thought of as the trunk of all the services that are provided to credit unions. And now we're seeing them more as a trunk on a tree where the physical trunk is now digital and then branch is one of the offerings and then there are others around it. So that's a different way to look at it. Now voice and video, we're already emerging as bridges between high touch in person and complete automation before the pandemic. Uh, and today we see more and more credit unions testing these technologies and more. Um, we're hearing about credit unions deploying simple chatbot technology that allows them to relieve some stress on members who can't communicate with the credit union during normal business hours and also to relieve burden on staff during the day who are already dealing with really elevated call volumes. So as a result of all this uh, proliferation of digital and voice and video, we are more focused than ever on data, which is why uh, I'm particularly excited about our new center focused on data analytics, because we have a really wonderful opportunity here in this moment to be part of the emerging conversations about how we can use data ethically uh, to lift people up. What are ways in which we can continue to 
minimize bias in algorithms because humans program the algorithms and whether or not we mean to, there is bias that can appear in algorithms. So how can we mitigate that by marrying human and digital technologies uh, to continue to provide that great service for which we're known? And then last but not least is payments. Now for years, our primary and historically in credit unions, our primary relationship with numbers was based on cash. Right? Uh, I remember many, many times as a kid going with my parents to the credit union so that my parents could deposit their checks uh, from the university and then also so that we could get cash, whether that be at the teller line or through what I call the plastic money machine because I really thought my dad put a piece of plastic in the machine and we pressed the magical buttons, money would just shoot out. I did not understand <laughs> that was attached to his accounts. Nevertheless, you know, the point is cash was the name of the game. Um, and now today, fast forward 40 something years, and now payments are emerging as the primary way that consumers interact with us. And if we just think about how we pay for things on a daily basis, that makes total sense, right? I mean, I can't remember the last time that I used cash. I don't, uh, I think my stepson has some in his little save and spend and uh, give boxes, but I don't have any cash. I only use cards. Uh, and I bet it would be similar, you know, if we went around the room. Uh, so when we think about payments as the foundation of the relationship that we have with members, that does mean that our relationships will be different and we have to rethink how that works. And it also offers some real opportunities for new segments like small businesses or young adults who live and, you know, survive by their phones. Um, and also for underserved populations or people who live in financial deserts. So when we wrap all these trends together during the crisis and after, we really see four business models for the future that begin to emerge. So on the y-axis, you'll see the level of interaction where at the top is a high touch, that personal interactive experience. And on the bottom of that uh, y-axis, you'll see very low touch or automated interaction. And then if you look at the x-axis, it's about the kind of provider that we are. So the right is us as the personal financial partner or the primary financial institution for those of us who have been around forever, right, where members come only to us. And then on the left is a platform aggregator. So the first organization that members go to when they need to find services. However, we will also point members to services outside the credit union uh, based on those that we trust and we know can provide the best service to the people that we're, we serve. Um, and so when we look around here and we look at, okay, what models fit in each one of these quadrants? Now, it's not to say that you need to be stuck in a box. In fact, credit unions are not stuck in a box. As, you, as we talk a little bit more about what these are, you'll see that you're, you may be really far over in a relationship banking, or you may be kind of a blend of relationship and concierge. Um, so relationship is all personal all the time. In the upper right hand, concierge is very high touch and personal, but also uses a lot of automation to help us deliver the most relevant information to a member. And then down in the bottom right is automated banking. And automated is really about efficiency driven by the data. How do we make the experience for members faster because of what we know about them? And how do we make our operations much faster and efficient because of the data that we have at our disposal? And then really kind of out there, if, if I could use that term, is ambient banking. And if you've had a chance to go to an Amazon Go store before the shutdown, for example, to have uh, at least one of them in Seattle, that's where you walk in and log into your Amazon Prime account, pick out the groceries you want and walk out the door without visiting a cashier. And the, what you bought is automatically charged to your Prime account. Okay, so that's where banking really moves into the background. And, uh, and so when we think about these, it's important to think about, hey, well, where do we fit today? So again, relationship banking is really high touch and personal. It's all about being nimble and responsive to member needs. Our mission has to be really closely tied to our values and the values are typically around community and cooperation. 
Now, in order to make those meaningful to members, we have to demonstrate alignment between those values and our capability to deliver on member expectations for speed, ease of use, and systems integration. And those are some areas where historically credit unions keep trying to get better, right? Um, and so that's really how relationship banking works. And then a little bit more about concierge, as I said. So it also is high touch, but it's platform based. So what that means is the credit union becomes this portal, the one-stop shop to all solutions that a member might need from a, from a financial services perspective. It's the place, I know I need some help with finances. I'm not sure where to go. I'm gonna call my credit union first because they're gonna tell me what would fit best at the credit union. And if the credit union can't help me, I believe that they will tell me the right place to go and help me take care of those relationships. And so this is a model of banking, if you read in the research, where we really talk about financial well-being and how concierge banking may be a way to bring financial well-being to the, to the center and make it really um, a part of a more full, a full featured personal financial coaching and wealth management suite. Now, automated banking, again, all about automation. If you're attracting millennials, for example, or high tech members, this is one that might be very interesting because it's all about leveraging technology like artificial intelligence to automate processes and to reduce costs, right? We want to save members time to make things very fast. And we want to use member data to fuel that automation, whether it's robotic processing or robotic processing automation, RPA, uh, you might hear those terms. That's to make routine tasks very automated, or maybe it's natural language processing that allows us to speak commands and get responses instead of having to type them. And even the more advanced risk assessments uh, that I talked about a little bit earlier in our conversation. And then last is that ambient banking that really you just, if you're standing near something or looking at a product online and you have the money to afford it, then your phone screen will turn green. That's what ambient banking really means. So as you take a look at these various models, um, I wonder if anyone wants to chime in and say, what do you, where do you think you are or Vermont credit unions are um, or the industry is or where we're headed or you know, what, are your, what are your thoughts about what I've shared around those banking models and, and what, what's resonating with you? This is Jean at Vermont Federal, and we're somewhere between relationship banking and automated automa banking. I can't get it out today. <laughs> that's okay. It's late on Monday. I understand. Thanks, Jean. What, what is it that's driving you toward automated? Is it the needs of your members? Is it, um, is it operational, or is it somewhere in the middle there, kind of a, a mixed bag? We actually, actually have a lot of young members, so... Yes that's really driving us on the automated side. And um, certainly with, um, with um, what's re happened recently, uh, you find that um, a lot of people have turned over to that area. So they're more interested in automation and digital interactions because they've gotten used to it and maybe in some cases feel it's safer. And so you're answering those needs right now and, and thinking about how you might expand that beyond COVID. Is that fair to say? Right, and our, our actual, our relationship banking transactions have decreased, and we don't mm. think it's going to continue. Oh, that's interesting. Now, are your branches open today, Jean, or do you have appointment only, or how's that looking, if you don't mind me asking? They're fully open. They're fully open, but you're seeing much less traffic than you were before the pandemic. Yes, and mm. a lot more automated transactions. Wow, wow, that's fascinating. Thanks for sharing, that's so interesting. Anyone else want to chime in? This is John. I, I, would, I would say we're in a similar place. We, we strive for uh, relationship banking, but the, the pull of automation right now is not gonna change. Uh, and I think has, has grown. We've seen a similar shift to what Gene described, uh, you know, away from the branch activity and in, into, um, automated or uh, digital banking. Um, but, and I think that's going to cont 
continue and, and probably will never come back at some level. Yeah, I, I, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens and I would not be surprised if you're right there, John. John, are you, all, are you starting to use um, specific automation, automated technologies such as artificial intelligence or um, any of the ways that it manifests today or is it really around, more around you know, being able to uh, deposit my check on my phone and apply for a loan that way, et cetera, and so forth? Yeah, I would say it's more functionality, you know, adding functionality versus, you know, we're, we're looking at technology mm -hmm. uh, and we've got plans for RPA and other technologies, but I won't claim any big sure. activity yet. <laughs> well, it's early days. There aren't yeah. many credit unions who are, are really, really far along, even those who have these massive call centers uh, are still kind of figuring it out. I've, I've heard a lot of chatbot technology and a lot of tiptoeing into RPA, but not a huge amount of use at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm no end all be all expert, but just based on the interactions that I've had with, uh, with credit unions of various sizes. So thank you for that. That's great. Anyone else want to chime in before we move on? Okay. Well, real, well, real quick, Aaron. So I don't have a credit union I run to, to uh, <laughs> talk about, but you know, I've been doing this job for a very long time now. And I vividly remember the days when, you know, whether it was folks like you or speakers in sessions or, or you know, credit union leaders and that everybody was, you know, advocating that where you needed to be was in that upper right hand corner in relationship banking. And that's, you know, what you needed to do and you needed, as you grew, it became more of a challenge and you need to strike a balance and so on and so forth. And you know, I, I would think that if there were a survey of credit unions right now asking which one of these four quadrants, you know, would you plot yourself in that, like you've just heard from two, that there might be some touches of some of the other areas, particularly automated banking one, but, you know, probably the vast majority would be anchored to some degree in that relationship banking quadrant. But I'm, I'm wondering from your working at the Institute and exposure to credit unions and other financial institutions. If you see in credit unions, maybe, certainly some banks, but do you see credit unions um, intentionally trying to move themselves towards the left side of the, of the screen chart? Sure, sure, it's a good question. Um, I'll just kind of take it from the top. Uh, Joe, you're so right, because I was around back then when PFI was the only language that we spoke, whether I worked in a credit union or as I moved to Vendorland, it was all about PFI, PFI, how do I become the PFI? And um, so I, I agree with you based on the knowledge that I have of many credit unions and the research we've done at the Institute, that relationship banking still remains our bread and butter and uh, where we're rooted. And uh, we do see... Um, credit unions moving to the left. And where I see uh, when we do strategic planning and we talk about this with boards and executive teams and say, okay, uh, get a little bit more into what, you know, uh, where your focus, where your value is, and let's plot it out, out on this X and Y uh, axis and kind of see where things land. We see a big chunk of stuff uh, of sticky notes in the relationship banking quadrant. And then we see a lot of crossover to automated and a lot to concierge. There are a number of credit unions nationally who are really interested in that approach, makes them a little nervous and also excited. Uh, nervous because it goes outside what we've always done. And that's a little bit, you know, thinking about offering partnerships with organizations, particularly outside our space is a little bit nerve wracking. And also maybe it's an opportunity for uh, non-interest income, particularly um, in the next few years when we're gonna need it. And if we can get that and also help point members to tools and services that they need um, that will help lift up their financial health, then that is very intriguing is what we're hearing. So it'll be interesting to see as time wears on uh, and you know, the needs of consumers evolve as does the economic situation and what that means to us and what we're able to do, uh, kind of, you know, how quickly and to what degree credit unions shift to the left and or toward the bottom. 
Thanks. Yeah, sure. All right, well, uh, let's move on here. Of course, please continue to chime in anytime that you'd like. So uh, to round things out, I thought now we'd go into financial futures. So what we did in the third series of the COVID reports that we wrote over the summer was we used insights around the themes and trends we were seeing from an economic perspective and a social perspective, a political perspective, all these different ways. And we said, okay, well, let's take a look at some continua Right, where we have these different poles um, of what could happen in the future. And then ask credit unions to think about where do you think your credit, where do you think reality is going to fall? It's likely to be somewhere between the poles. Um, so here's what I mean. So here's kind of, here are the things that we're uh, looking at. So we're looking at financial futures, which, and that's where we're going to kind of spend our time for the last little bit that we have together today. In the report, you can also dig some more into political futures and to social, cultural, and technological futures. Given the short period of time that we have, I talked with Joe about this and we just decided, you know what, we'll just tackle one of these and, and start to have a conversation about it and then invite you to continue the conversation. And most certainly if you have questions or want to dig deeper with me, you're, anyone is welcome to do that and I'll leave my contact information. So let's just take a look here. So first, uh, consumer credit in real estate. So um, one of the immediate effects of the economy going into hibernation in mid-March was consumers' inability to stop making regular payments for things that are important like rent, utilities, paying for the phone bill, and also their bills with us, loan repayments and credit cards. And we saw a huge outpouring of support from credit unions across North America as they offered assistance and had deferments and and skip a pay programs and allowed people forbearance and all sorts of programs to help credit unions through that initial shock. Now we do see that in large part abating over time, we hope, and also recognize that there will be groups of members who will continue to need some longer term uh, support. So um, now we also think that since you know, federal funding was great and helped people in the short term uh, until the CARES Act expired. And now, as I mentioned toward the top of the hour, as the time gets longer between when that aid expired and today, um, we're starting to see incomes drop. We're slowly starting to see uh, consumers bite into the savings that they've been hoarding, if you will, or really, you know, being cautious about for the past several months so that they can continue to pay their bills. So um, time will tell how that continues. Uh, and meanwhile, we still have to continue to serve our members. And so in this uncertain time, there are two crises that may impact us a lot. And one is in consumer credit and the other is in real estate. So that's kind of the macro. And then if you look at the very top here, you'll see one poll is the temporary pandemic rescue package expired. Well, yes, that did happen. And then on the other one is additional federal relief keeps consumers and businesses afloat. Well, there are packages on the floor of Congress that have been discussed and we're not gonna get into all the details of course, but a lot of back and forth about the pros and cons and how much is enough or not enough and when it should happen and how it gets paid and all of that. So despite the fact it's taken, taken a long time, if you look at this first continuum, it's likely that the reality will lay somewhere in the middle between the left and the right, right? There's, there's likely to be some more aid to consumers, particularly since the pandemic is not gonna end tomorrow and the economic situation uh, the Fed believes is gonna last for a while here. So how do we provide, you know, the government is likely to give some support to additional support to consumers. So that's the first one. Then the next one is around deferments, which is related to the top one, right? So we provided lots of great support as did many, many financial institutions in banking and credit unions uh, at the outset of the crisis. And those deferments are gonna come due. They're starting to come due now. And as we get into the winter, we'll, more and more are gonna come due. And given what's happened, depending on what's going on with the economy and also with the pandemic and uh, whether or not people are able to go to work and so forth, um, will 
consumers be able to pay those? Or, and if they are, how many more requests are we going to get? And how are we going to be able to, you know, how creative can we get to provide solutions to members? And then you can see how these go on and on. So the next one is about large scale defaults. What's going to happen with delinquencies? Are we going to continue to see more and more losses? Are they going to be a huge scale? Uh, and many of us are preparing for that as we're putting more and more money to our loan loss reserves. Um, or will we, you know, are we going to cancel some debt? What are, you know, how is that, what's the reality going to be? And then skip down a couple to evictions. So housing insecurity is a real threat right now. Um, the eviction moratorium was extended, but we're already hearing noise and stories of people who are being asked by individual landlords to leave. Um, and we're hearing more and more people who have lost income, either in whole or in part, who are no longer able to afford their rent or their mortgages. And so, you know, these are people who are going to be looking for housing in the dead of winter during a recession and a pandemic. So this is not a political statement. It is a reality and it impacts the way that we serve. And so that's why this line is under this uh, credit in real estate. So the question becomes for us, where do we think this is going to happen? Where do we think the reality is going to lie? Keeping in mind that there's lots of uncertainty and there's no for sure, as we said at the beginning of the hour, uh, if you expect something to happen, it won't, it'll be the opposite. But we just have to do the best we can with what we know, right? And then the last one, of course, is that at the, oh, excuse me, on the one pole, the recession accelerates into a depression, which did not happen in 2008. And all economic indicators point to the fact that that will not occur. Or is the economy gonna rebound? You know, on that right side, is it gonna rebound to the same level where it was or even higher? And how quickly does that happen? And will that impact uh, spread across all demographics? Or will it be more like a K where um, middle and upper class Americans get through just fine and middle and lower class, you know, working class Americans have a more difficult time, that kind of thing. So that's what we're talking about in that last one. So again, looking to determine based on what we know about our environment and the members we serve, where do we think our reality is going to lie, right? And then what does that mean to our operational environment is the next question. So what we've done in this workshop guide in this third report series, which I'm gonna send you a link to, is to pose some questions for you to consider with your credit union, you know, with your executive teams, and more broadly, as an industry in Vermont, in the Northeast, and even beyond. So first, I mean, what are the leading and lagging indicators that you think um, are the best way to monitor economic shifts going forward? So, you know, internationally, I mean, I'm sorry, nationally, GDP is a really big one, and uh, so is spending, spending habits and mobility. So some good news in GDP, it went up like seven and a half percent almost, which is really great. Uh, you may have seen, oh, it went up 33%. Well, that's not really right because that's saying if the economy grew at the same rate across the whole year, how much would it be? So it's kind of inflated for a quarterly. However, the good news is the economy grew. That is great. The other news is that the GDP fell more in Q2 than it grew in Q3. So the net result is that the economy is actually about three and a half percent smaller than it was at this point in 2019. And that is really about the same place where it was when we started the Great Recession. That doesn't mean we're gonna be in the same place as we were in the Great Recession, but it does mean we have a long way to go to see the kind of uh, economic health that we were seeing before the pandemic struck, right? And then in terms of durable goods, we're seeing that the bulk amount of spending that credit union, that, that members are doing is there. It's in home appliances and things like that. It's not in retail, it's not in, uh, it's not in restaurants and things like that, that, uh, that help other workers. And so that is a sign that, you know, the economy is still in a contraction. 
So those are a couple of national insights. What are your thoughts around what are good economic indicators? Employment's another good one. And here we could hear crickets if there were any. I know, I know, I know you all look at economic indicators. I also know that it is 447 on Monday and uh, it has been a crazy couple weeks. So I totally understand everyone's silence. Um, that link that you see track that says track economic shifts points to another paper where uh, we give some recommendations about macroeconomic indicators. And of course we also recommend uh, that you check out creditunions.com. Our partner at Callahan Associates, as you all know, they're great experts at uh, looking at numbers and indicators of credit unions in the industry. And they're a great resource, whether or not you do business with them to just see kind of what's going on in the industry as well as, uh, as many of our trades. Do, do you mind putting that uh, link, Aaron, in the chat box for people to grab if they want? Yeah, you know, I don't have it at my dispose. Oh. I can't get to it because I'm in pre That's presentation okay. mode. Can, but I can, it. yeah, I can send it to you and it will also, um, yeah, I'll do that. I'm sorry, I should have put it in the, made sure it was active in the presentation, but I can make sure that it is because it is a, it's an industry, interesting, it's just a blog post, it's easy read. Um, and it's really, it's really good. Um, all right, so, well, let's move on. I know we're getting toward the end and everyone's tired. So, but um, any of these others that are, that are really striking to you? I mean, are, what, are, what are people looking at in terms of people falling behind on their payments? Are you tracking in particular deferrals and how close they're getting to their uh, due date if you've done deferments? and how many members are paying or in a position where they could pay? Um, are, what are you doing in terms of looking at your credit card portfolios? So Aaron, this is John again. I'll, I'll just weigh in that the big focus we have is on uh, what happens at the end of the deferrals. So we're yeah. tracking uh, across product type, uh, you know, whether people start paying, whether they ask for additional deferrals, uh, but that's been our biggest uh, focus right now because most, most of the 90, obviously we've gone through the 90 days at least once in most cases. Uh, so that's and been a big indicator for us as we get ready for year end. And John, with the 90 days, did you find that most members were able to get back up to date or did you have a lot of people who asked for further deferral or did you notice any trends? So, so I'll keep that in house if I could just. Oh, to, I'm sorry. I know. Uh, I, don't mean to, to. I, I certainly understand the question, uh, but I, uh, yeah, I think in the context of what are we looking at, uh, that's, that's where we're. Okay. Focused. That's fair. And I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. That's okay. Uh, sometimes, especially when I've done multiple presentations in a day, I lose track of the competitive nature of certain certain geographies. So my apologies to everyone there. I didn't mean to make it weird. Okay, well, let's keep moving then. Uh, so another one is around emerging struggles. So, you know, we are seeing, and this is not from a socioeconomic, it sort of is, but it's also from a regulatory perspective, right? So we remember in the recession that that because of that crisis, a lot of regulations went into play with the goal of protecting consumers, Dodd-Frank and the CFPB. And we know that that has been very difficult for us. It's been helpful to many consumers and not to all consumers. It's also been hard for us from a regulatory perspective. And we also know that recently the Supreme Court ruled that the structure of the CFPB is unconstitutional and meanwhile, the agency finalized a rule around removing restrictions for small dollar loans, which had really helped stem the predatory lending space in the past few years. Now, some of this could be good news for the way that we serve these recent, uh, these recent, this recent, these recent developments. But there's also some concern that, especially, for example, as that payday loan provision expires that it could put consumers in a position where they could fall in some of the same debt traps that existed in the past. However, there are some really creative ideas in Congress and beyond 
um, about how we, we might serve in different ways there. So in terms of helping people out during the pandemic, there's an idea floating around about prepaid debit cards that are funded by the treasury by minting new money. Um, we saw the evolution of what are called economic impact cards. And those were ways that uh, underserved people were paid when they didn't have bank accounts. Now we also know that there, we, it uncovered some weaknesses uh, in our federal system because those people who did not have bank or credit, card, credit union accounts, it took them much longer time to uh, get their CARES Act payments. Um, so there has been, as a result of this, there's, it's always kind of been kind of in the fringes. People have been talking about, we should bring back postal banking because post offices are still there and the post office needs help. And this would be a great way to bring that all together. And now because of what's been happening with the economy and so forth, there's more noise around, hey, we should bring back postal banking like it was um, in the early 19, through the middle of the, of the 1900s. So those are some ideas uh, and there are many more, but those are just a couple of high level ideas that are out there. So these are some things for us to consider at a macro level. And then on the continuum is around, okay, well, what if all of those protections get completely rolled back? What does that mean for us? What does it mean for our members? And on the other end, what if there are all of these the federal government comes up with all these programs, which again mean more regulations that are meant to help members uh, that could be great and could also, you know, be something that we have to address that could be stressful. Now, the reality is likely in the middle of, the, of that somewhere. And of course, since we're in a transfer of federal power, there, we're probably not going to know very much, right, in the next few months because there's very little that will get done uh, based on history. So that's something for us to look out for and just start the conversation around where, where do we think things are gonna land and what is that, what is that impact gonna to be to us? It might, it might be very small or it could be bigger depending upon where you are and who you serve. Um, also around lending. So the second one, you know, during the Great Recession, we actually studied credit unions who did very, very well despite the challenging economic conditions. And the two things that they did the best were, number one, really prudent lending standards that figured out a way to loosen risk where they thought they had the least amount of chance of, of default and helping more members at the same time that they were very careful and uh, member friendly fee income. So that means how to, how to amplify non-interest income for services that members really need. Uh, so maybe that's uh, an additional fee for mortgage lending, or maybe it's buying into a QSO that offers an off-balance sheet service like wealth management uh, that helps give members more services and also gives us a little bit more income that is not related to interest. Okay, so that's, that's what that one is about. Um, you know, will we, or will you individually, be more conservative with your lending or Will you work really hard to figure out how you can open lending, uh, looking outside the traditional notions of, of credit score and uh, credit reporting agencies to figure out who qualifies uh, for credit and who has the best chance of paying you back? Um, and where does that reality lay for you? you know, and, and as John alluded, it's going to be different for each of you. And uh, the way that you serve is different too. So those are you know, very personal decisions and where you think you land today may be different tomorrow. And there aren't wrong answers. Um, it's really around how do you begin to have a conversation and begin to explore where you might fall and then what are you going to do about it? So here are some exploratory questions around emerging struggle. So for example, the last question here is, what should we adjust if declines in loan demand and non-interest income continue into the medium term? And what triggers should we set for making course adjustments? Now I bet each of you have started to have these conversations to one degree or another. The idea of this report is not to tell you what to do because you're running your credit unions and you know what you're doing. But it is to say, how can we broaden the conversation based on the insights? And you know, what are ways in which we might help you do that and keep your eye out, not just two years in the future, but 10 years in the future and beyond. So that's really the point. 
So um, there's also creativity and innovation. And then of course, all of those other uh, futures as well. And then the way you tie this all together is to say, okay, if we're firmly rooted in relationship banking and tending more toward automated or more toward concierge or some blend of those, then what do these financial futures mean for our future business model? Does it change it or does it keep it the same? Does it make things move faster or make us roll back a bit? And that's how you really tie everything together. So that's how you can make use of all the reports. So here is, uh, which you will get a copy of this presentation shortly, is a link to the 21st Century Report. Also a link to the COVID series. It is the third report that has the workshop sheet and the workshop guide that we've kind of used as a foundation for our discussion today. And I will just send you that PDF too, um, Joe, so you can pass it along to everybody sure. if they'd like it, that's fine. Okay. Um, and then um, please do remember that we at Feline are here to help, whether you have friends at the Institute that you know personally, and I know many of you do, or if I as leader of advisory services can be helpful with an individual question with the, hey Aaron, can you point me to this research? Can you remind me what thus and so scholars said about this a million years ago? Or I just need you to point me in the direction on the topic of board governance, just for some examples. Happy to do that anytime. And we also are very happy to uh, dig deeper with your individual organizations. Uh, and we offer all of these things like workshops and strategy discussions, et cetera. Um, and if you're interested in learning any more about those, please do reach out to me and be happy to explain some more. And uh, Joe, just in closing, thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope this was helpful. And um, I look forward to uh, working with you all again in the future. And hopefully someday I'll get up to um, my home region of New England. I was born in Connecticut in New Haven many years ago. So I didn't know that. Wow. Yes, indeed. Connecticut awesome. girl. Hey, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, any, any questions or follow-up comments or anything from anybody? I know, Aaron, we, you know, during this last segment that you were talking about, I know we said we weren't going to get into the political aspects of things. It just seems to me, and I know you're not a lobbyist, uh, but it seems like so much hinges, you know, the other shoe that we're, we're waiting to have drop right now is what's going to happen with the U.S. Senate. And although yes. it's probably unlikely that it shifts to the other party, um, it, you know, it's still a possibility and until that's resolved. It seems like um, the political party control of the two chambers of Congress has a lot of bearing on this last section that you just talked about here. It does have a lot of bearing. I mean, I think all of the, the political landscape federally has a big bearing on all of this. Um, you know, of course, the popular vote is complete, but there are legal challenges ahead uh, from both parties. And, you know, we may not even know that until the Electoral College meets. I mean, it, there's, we still got a ways to go before that is finalized. And then the next thing is the Senate and those runoff elections are scheduled for the first, I think, uh, January 5th or 3rd or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, right. And so it won't be until the beginning of the year that really anything can a, happen in Congress, and B, we, we have a little better sense of how, how things are going to be decided moving forward. Um, and so that said, you know, based on the past and just given all the things we have in front of us, yes, we have to, you know, kind of figure out, okay, where do we spend our most energy right now? And also, please don't wait till after the decisions are made uh, to continue the strategy discussions because, you um, a lot, a lot happens all at once. And so the more consideration we've given, uh, even if it's just brief for 15 minutes here and there, I think the faster we can get to what we'll do next, uh, both in the short, medium and long term. Thank you so much, Aaron, for your uh, time that you contributed to all of us this afternoon and your insightful uh, observations and discussions. Uh, I found it informative and enlightening and interesting. And I hope all the rest of you did too. And thank you to all the rest of you for taking time out of your busy day and the kind of whirlwind last week or so uh, to spend the first day of this week or part of it anyway, uh, in discussion with us. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate all of you and, and your time. This has been thank excellent, you. thank you. Oh, thanks, Jean, I appreciate that. And I hope each of you and your teams and your families stay self safe and well. 
Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week, everybody.